I'm sitting in the auditorium about where this gentleman right there in, with the goatee, good-looking fellow there, was about Thursday morning, and, um, and we were praying uh, Thursday morning about the upcoming inaugural and, and uh, inauguration s- ceremony, and, and, and several had prayed, and I was just sitting there, and then I began to feel uh, almost, uh, you know, I describe it as sick, but it was just a heaviness in my in my belly. And I thought, well, what's happening? You know, what's going on here? And am I getting sick? Am I going to need to uh, pray and and uh, get some healing here? And then I understood what was happening to me. I was beginning to experience uh, for myself the grief of God over the division that we are suffering as a nation. But well beyond that, and um, even though we can relate to it, covering many other areas of life. And so I heard God just speak to me as I was be- beginning to figure out what, what I was sensing, what I was feeling in my, in my own heart, spirit, that God wanted me to talk today about prayers that, that promote healing. And I'm not talking about physical healing, although when we are in need of physical healing, something is broken as well. There's something divided in our physical body that's going on that needs peace. It needs, again, the wholeness of God somehow ministered to it. And, uh, and so I, I got, actually I got pretty excited and pretty overwhelmed at the same time thinking about the subject, prayer that promotes healing. Again, we're in a time of prayer and fasting, and I think this is a part of it already, and, and God wants us to maybe focus a little bit more on this moving, moving forward. So I just began to, to again, uh, ask for the help of the Holy Spirit, show me some things in the Word. And, and so I, I brought some things to you today that I, I do believe will help us, but I, I believe it will help us fulfill an assignment. Because we don't want to be a part of the grief. Or, or do we? We don't want to be a part, we Christians, don't we don't want to be a part of the grief. We don't want to be a part of the pain. We don't want to be a part of the brokenness and the tearing down of things that clearly are important uh, to God. Uh, it's not about politics today, so you can relax. It's not about that. It's, it's really just about praying in a way that promotes healing in, in all aspects uh, of life. Uh, the worst tearing that can happen is, is within the heart. The worst bruising that can take place is not in the body. It's actually in the heart. Even Jesus mentioned that about his anointing. How he was anointed to do a number of things. But he was anointed to, to bring healing to the broken hearted. And to minister to their, to their bruising. And if anybody's going to do that with any success. Moving forward into 2017. It will be those in the church of Jesus Christ, who know how to pray from their reconciled position with God. Because we are at peace with God. I know it doesn't always feel that way, but that's the biblical truth, the fact. And from that place of experiencing that real peace with God, we can affect uh, the lives of other people. Uh, our, our, our lives can be affected by that. There can, again, be a, a measure of wholeness that we experience that we can't experience any other way from that place of peace. The same can be true in your house. A house divided itself uh, uh, against itself will fail. It will falter. There is no al- alternative to it except to come back to what brings peace. And that is a right relationship with God. I'm going to show you this from the scripture. It has, it has to begin there. There are other things that we end up saying, we end up doing in way of behaviors that, that, that come from that place of peace that really, really do uh, create miraculous things uh, in life. Uh, if your home is broken, there's, there's wholeness for your, those relationships. Come on, take hope this morning. It may seem impossible, but God can do the impossible. And I mean, that's become a cliche, but it's still truth. Is God loves to take on our impossibilities. And he can take a home where there's strife 
And again, where there's been uh, deep wounds, and he can turn that around and bring about healing and wholeness, and that family can go on to thrive. There are other areas. In fact, you know, uh, when, when the scripture talks about wars and wars continuing in the world, it's funny, the same words used to describe war between nations is used to actually describe war between ourselves. In James chapter 4, he talks about the warrings that are in us, the strivings that we're experiencing with one another. Uh, it's the same, same deal. Uh, the world has been in conflict since Adam and Eve decided to get into conflict with God. And so it gave birth to conflict in our world. And it's all around us. It surrounds us. And so uh, what can we do about it? Well, again, I believe that we can learn and then do. We can learn how to pray prayers that produce healing and produce wholeness. And if we'll commit to that, and it's a big if, but if we will commit to that, then we can see again, guys, the glory of God in all aspects of life. And, uh, and if, you know, among other things that we're here for, we're here to represent the Prince of Peace in our world. And some people, Christians, uh, I, you know, we have, many of us have such a real strong sense of right and wrong and injustice. And some of that really has been taught to us by God and is encouraged uh, to know and live by the Holy Spirit. But a lot of us go from even a good place of knowing right and wrong and knowing what is righteous and what is not, truly knowing what is good and what is evil. But we go from a place of knowing that and we spoil it in the way that we handle uh, our situation, in the way we handle our relationships. And so what a tragedy to really have the heart of God on some issue and, and then spoil it. Uh, ruin it before it has a chance to take hold simply by the way that we're treating one another, the way we say the things we say or the way we do the things that we, we do. And uh, in all of this, I really felt like God was saying, the church, my people can do this. Uh, if they will do this, my people can do this. And uh, in fact, so I started thinking about all these verses of Scripture Old and New Testament. And, and so I've written some of them down. Let's see how many we can get to this morning before we really do uh, just have to uh, stop. Uh, I want to start by something Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 5. And there's several verses here, but I want you to note one verse out of the bunch that I'm going to read to you. There's one verse in particular. It'll be up on the screen from you, for you from Matthew chapter 5. And verse 44, Jesus said this. He's talking about living, the, I call it the extraordinary life or the exceptional way of life. He's talking about, uh, you know, when someone does evil to you, you don't return the evil. You overcome the evil with good. You know, when he, he's, he's talking about, um, you know, turning the other cheek. He's talking about going the extra mile. He's talking about, you know, being generous with your life when someone asks you for a coat, you go ahead and just say, hey, you know what, take my cloak too. Uh, so you do more than is required of you. That's the Christian way. That's what Jesus, that's the way Jesus lived. Uh, that's the way those who, who follow him want to live or endeavoring to live. And, and right in the middle of all that, he says this, verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. He would say before this, you've heard that it's, it's been said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45 says that you might be children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to shine, his son to shine on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Verse 46 says, For if you love those who love you, uh, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans, or those who really don't know God, um, you know, they do the same. They love those who love them. Verse 47, If you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others do not even the publicans so? But ye, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, 
which is in heaven, is perfect. So very quickly here, four things we see in just these few verses. The one verse, really that I noted, verse 44, mark them down with you, carry them with you through, throughout the rest of the year. They're very simple, but he says, first of all, love. Everybody say that out loud. He says, love. He says, in particular, love your enemies. Thank you, God. We needed to remember that. Love, not just those who are on our side, but love those not, uh, who are enemies. Don't just love those who, um, who, are, who are, uh, have our back and who speak well of us, but learn how to love and love those who are our enemies. Number two, he said, bless. Say that out loud, bless. He said, bless those who actually curse you. In other words, instead of you return again, the cursing, give them something uh, better. Give them something that will lift up the situation. Instead of doing what was done to you, do something other than that. By my spirit, bless those who curse you. Number three, he said, do good. Say it out loud, do good. He says, love, bless, and do good. Watch this, to those who hate you. Don't just return good for good. But when people actually show or exhibit hatred toward you, there's plenty of that to go around. You don't need to add to it. I don't need to add to it. He says, instead, do this, do good. Find a way to do good for those who don't do you good. And then he said, pray for those, say it out loud, pray. pray. Pray for those who despitefully use you, who don't just use you or take advantage of you, but who despitefully use you and persecute you. Again, instead of doing what, returning what they did to us, what we're to do as believers is to pray for them. So here's, the, here's a great code of, of uh, conduct, if you will, or behavior, following Jesus, going into uh, this year and dealing with our real life situations. Uh, love, bless, do good, and pray. Let's say all that t- together and out loud. Love, bless, do good, and pray. Look, at, look to at least one person. Look them in the eye and say the same thing. Love, bless, do good, and pray. And again, that doesn't have to do with people who are uh, just of a different political party than you are. Um, you know, who has a different uh, view, conservative, liberal, whatever, in between th- than you do. Uh, this doesn't have to do with just a national issue. It has to do with our everyday issues and particularly with our everyday issues. And so I believe the spirit of God would, would make us uncomfortable with not doing uh, this very thing as we're moving forward. But at the same time that he would help us because it's humanly, you know, the flesh really is weak and we experience that every day. We like to think it's not, but about the time we think our flesh is strong we find that that's not the truth. And we, we slip and we slide and we cross over when we shouldn't. And so we, we want to believe that God helps us moving forward. Can I have a good amen? And some of you are thinking about people that need to hear this today. No, you need to hear it. I need to hear it. Everybody in the house needs to hear it. God has you here today for you to hear it, especially. And those of you who are not cowboy fans need to remember that today when it comes to me. Okay, just say it. Be sweet, be kind, be gracious. I'll try to do the same with you. Amen. Love, bless, do good, and pray. On the more serious side of all this, what Jesus is really saying is, is he's saying, if you, if you do this, you will be like your father. In other words, you'll represent him to others. You'll be like him. You'll be like your father who's in heaven. This is the way he acts. He causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He causes it to rain on the just and the unjust he does that to reach to them to try to help he does that to introduce who he is to them uh, and he works through his people uh, to do that loving only those who love us jesus made it clear has no reward there's no reward to just loving people who love us it's not thankworthy at all to just love people who love us or who are, in our view, lovable. He goes on to say, if if you are only gracious to those who are gracious to you, then you don't really understand grace and haven't yet shown it. Because grace is the unmerited favor and blessing of God. Amen. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. If you could, then what you would get would not be grace. Does that make sense to you? So he said, be complete. He said, be perfect. 
The word really means in the Greek to be complete. In other words, be complete in your loving the way that the Father God is complete in his loving. God loves thoroughly. And so we are urged to also love thoroughly. And so a big part of turning things around in a world at war, in hearts that are at war, is to learn how to pray in such a way that turns those things around. In fact, it dawned on me again Thursday uh, during the afternoon after that experience I had Thursday morning, again from Isaiah chapter 58. Just make note of that. We won't read from a bunch of that. I do want to remark from it. I do want to show you some things from it. But Isaiah 58 has, has come to be known as the, the uh, God's chosen fast chapter, kind of like the way 1 Corinthians 13 has been deemed by Christians the love chapter. Isaiah 58 is actually a chapter all about God's chosen fast or the kind of fasting that God would have us do, actually do. And he is chiding Israel. He's correcting them, again, because they've entered into a way of thinking about prayer and fasting that doesn't agree with him. And it, again, it has no value, no reward to it, no benefit for anyone. And so God is intruding upon that way of thinking. And he's saying, I want you to, to, to come to know really what I think, not only about your fasting, but the way uh, I think about, about fasting. He said this beginning in verse 4. Again, we don't have time to go over there uh, this morning. But he says in verse 4, he says, you're, you're fasting for strife and you're fasting for debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness so that your voice can be heard on high. In other words, what he's saying is you're fasting and praying to win your arguments and your debates with other people. And you hear that sometimes when Christians pray. They're not really praying the heart of God, the mind of God, the will of God. They're not praying for the scripture or the word of God. They're actually praying out their own argument. And they're actually asking God to make everybody else see what they think they see. And God, I want you to change the whole world if necessary so that I can be right. Essentially, it's a prideful, arrogant way to pray. Can we say, oh me, today? Uh, in other words, you want me, God's saying, you want me to prove you're right. And that's, that's peace to you. And he's saying, is this what you call a fast? Do you really, he's asking these questions. Do you really think that this is pleasing and acceptable to me? We also forget that probably most of us forget or we, we've never known that when Isaiah 58 was being written, actually when Isaiah was the prophet, he was prophet in Israel for about 50 years. And he actually had inroads because of his own genealogy into the royalty, if you will, of Israel. His platform was in the realm of politics uh, in Israel and uh, during this time that he was used of God to, to speak out. We forget when, when God was saying these things through Isaiah to Israel, or we've never known that Israel was also in a time of civil war. Now, that's very relevant because our nation, whether we say it out loud or not, is in a civil war. It's not like the one that was in the 1800s, but we've, we're in a civil war. And you can feel it and you can sense it. And uh, again, it, it's, it, it really is threatening. Uh, to the health and wholeness of our nation and the citizens of our nation. But again, it's not really something new. When uh, tribes began to be formed in Israel, they immediately began to fight with one another. There were ten tribes who made up uh, Israel. I'll, I'll call it Israel North. Uh, Israel North was sometimes referred to in the scripture as Ephraim. And the capital city of Israel North was actually Samaria. And Israel South was referred to as Judah, and its capital was Jerusalem. And the ten tribes in the north were at odds with the two tribes in the south, and, and so they were struggling with one another. And, and, and during a time of civil war in, uh, in, God's, uh, in the nation of Israel, God spoke through his prophet these very things that we're, uh, kind of, we're studying and looking at today. It, it was meant to help them with their own issues of, of uh, tearing and division and brokenness. It was meant to help them and it will help us if we will pay attention to what God taught them. 
The res- it's interesting to me that the result of the division in Israel was similar to, to, uh, to uh, the source of our division in many ways in America. Isaiah the prophet would come and he would say he would be urged by the people, let's make some alliances with our enemies and become stronger. And Isaiah would say to them by the Spirit of God, he said, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to trust God alone. In other words, I want you, all of you, all 12 tribes of you, to turn back to God. Turn back to me. Turn away from the things you've come to trust in and your idols and turn back to me. And so he goes on and kind of lays this out. Are you, are you still interested at all? Are you interested in it at all? I believe, I believe God has something for us here. Church family. Verse 6, he says, This time of prayer and fasting should be a time of loosing men from their wrong, their guilt, and their wickedness. A time of actually loosing them. How do we do that? By forgiving them. By loving them. We don't have to agree That they're wrong thinking. We don't have to agree with wrong thinking and wrong behavior. Immoral thinking, immoral behavior. You don't have let me put you at rest today. Those of you who are so combative, you're still so insecure. It's the one of the reasons you're so combative is because you're insecure. You don't trust that God is going to win in the end. You're still looking to others. You're still looking to your government. You're looking to other people. You're looking to yourself. Instead of looking to God where peace is. And when we do that, we'll be combative, but we'll be combative with the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness that's in the heavenly places that really is influence. I don't think we understand that all of us in the room today, for whatever reason, we think we might be the exception, but none of us are the exception. We are what we've been influenced to do and what we have embraced. All of us. We are the product of either God's influences or the influences of darkness, however they've come. When we valued them, they became a part of us. And so if, here's the wisdom of God, if we will take our spiritual energy, authority, and power, which we have in Jesus, and stop aiming it at one another... Take this great, vast, powerful weaponry, this armor that's been provided to us, and stop trying to point it at one another and start pointing it at the influences and defeating them and bringing them down and instead praying the influences of the holy God into the life of people fervently. Because it's the effectual fervent prayer. Stop praying them conveniently. Only when your taxes rise. Only when you're a little stirred up. Only when there's a president-elect who's not a politician. He doesn't know how to say things politically correct. All right? And stop pointing the finger at all of those who disagree And start getting right with God ourselves. Ouch. And stop praying prayers at one another. Instead of praying against those who are causing men's hearts to go these directions. Watch what God can do. Amen. Did I lose some of you right there? He goes on to say in this. Let's get back to the word here. He says, this is a time to undo. Everybody say undo. To undo the heavy burdens. Not add to them. But to undo them, and these have to do with unimaginable expectations or enslaving responsibilities. Undo the heavy burdens. He goes on to say, this is a time of time of prayer and fasting. should be a time to let the oppressed go free. The Hebrew word is rasas, which means to crack into pieces. It refers to those who have been bruised, those who have been crushed, those who have been discouraged. Include among those, those these Included among these are people who have been subjected to all manner of prejudices and injustice. God forgive us for these racial wars and these social wars that we continue to fuel and feed and fire up from our own hearts instead of being promoters of peace. 
God said to pray in such a way that every yoke would be broken. Now watch this one. What does that mean? Well, a yoke is something, again, heavy on our shoulders. No, really a yoke was designed. It may be heavy, but the yoke was designed to put two together. A yoke was by design to put two oxen or two horse, horses together in the field so that they could walk together and actually do something productive. But the Bible teaches not to be unequally yoked. Hello. So one of the things that we need to pray in promoting peace and healing, watch this, are right relationships. God was actually saying, I want you to pray. And again, remember just the, the context, of, at least the part of the context of, of this, Isaiah 58, is that, that uh, there were unholy and ungodly alliances that were being created among uh, nations. Assyria was coming down from the north. They were threatening. And so, again, Israel, uh, turning from God to trust idols, Actually, some of Israel, they were trying to negotiate with the enemies of God in order to just feel safe. And part of what God was saying is these agreements, these sort of alliances, they're not good. They're not, they're not me. And you need to pray that people are loosed from them. And I'm going to tell you today, some of us are in the wrong kinds of relationships some of us in this room here today have formed alliances with people who are the enemies of God. And they are sowing seeds of discord and they are sowing seeds of disagreement into our lives. And unless we do something by the power of God to, to remove our, or be removed from that, then we're going to continue to be a part of the problem instead of part of the solution. And so we need to be asking God who that is in our own life. What do we do with this? How do we handle this graciously? How do we handle this lovingly? But how do we get this taken care of? Isaiah went on urging men to pray that these bad ties would be broken, every one of them, and that they would turn back to God. He went on to say this. He said, instruct men in this type of prayer to feed the hungry with our own bread. Not someone else's bread. Our own bread. We make the sacrifice. We make the personal investment. We make ourselves, if you will, a little poorer. So that somebody else might be made a little richer. We do that. We don't put that responsibility again on other people. He went on to say again, consider those who were cast out of their homes. These are normally responsible people who have fallen on hard times, need some temporary health. He went on to say, we should be clothing the naked. He went on to say this, pray for the reconciliation of he or healing of families in particular. He says it this way in the King James Version, refers to it as the hiding from our own flesh. In other words, in our homes, there's this isolation that takes place. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, you can be lonely in a crowd? And sadly, we have that on a real small scale where the family unit is controlled. We have fathers who are isolating themselves from their children. We have sons and daughters isolating themselves from their moms. We have all siblings isolating themselves from other siblings, sibling strife. And God says, during prayer, this kind of prayer, I want you to pray for healing. I want you to pray for wholeness. I want you to pray that this hiding would stop and that once again men and women would, would come together. I'm going to close with this because I just ran out of time. The 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17, says, Now we look, this is by the way from the Message Bible, it says, Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Look at it. Verse 18, all this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. Verse 19, God put the word square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. Verse 20 says, For where's, uh, we are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop 
their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between us. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How, verse 21, you say, in Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. And what this is referring to is that, of course, we've, have, we've been reconciled to God. We have peace with God now through Jesus Christ. On top of that, you and I, who have experienced this forgiveness and this new life in Christ, we now have been given a ministry. Every single one of us have been given the ministry, not of accusation, not of condemnation, not of correction. I know the word we preach is suitable for correction. But it's not always your place to be the one correcting. Your ministry is bridge building. Your ministry is, is referred to as the ministry of reconciliation. If we just settle that, church family, we, I just think we begin to find a different way to say important things and do important things without compromise. We're not trying to make everybody happy. That's impossible. You probably experienced that on your way to work today. Somebody's not driving as fast as you would drive. And I, I get it. I tell you, I, it's frustrating when you have somewhere to go and you're behind someone who doesn't know where they're going or doesn't want to get there very fast. And you can't seem to get her. I know, I get that. This is real life. But you're not going to make it better. And you're not gonna produ- I'm not going to produce wholeness by just getting on their tail and pushing and then signaling, not with our turn signal, as we pass. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Help me with this this morning. We're going to... We're going we're gonna to do what, the opposite of what's being done to us. If you want something different, you do something different. If you want racial equality, you treat all the races equal. You learn how to respect all the races. You learn those things and you determine to live that way with your life. When someone yells, it gets in your face and screams at you. You just learn to be quiet. Let your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth. Maybe that's not the time to give them a piece of your mind. Maybe there's never a time to give them the peace, a peace of mind. Maybe it's just a time really to pray for wholeness. Because you know I'm really convinced that broken people do broken things. Hurting people do hurting things. You say, it's not fair. Well, hey, God is the God. God is the judge. One day he's going to work it all out. I just don't think any of us are bright enough to handle it. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm just saying you're, we're not bright enough to figure all this out. God sees people the way we need to see them. God knows things about people. We just don't know. And we think we know. And we act on that piece of knowledge. And sometimes we just make the situation far worse than it has to be. How many of you ever said something you wish you hadn't said? How many of you have done something you wish you'd never done? You went, my God, the situation was bad. I just really made it bad. And Jesus is just, I mean, he's working in us. Be confident of this. He's working in us to put things back together that had been broken. I just thought, I close with this, really, I stop with this. I have to, have to, have to. Just, just open your Bible, please, sometime this week. And just begin to watch Jesus again. Just watch him. And even when it's, it seems like he's, got, he, he's, get, he, he's getting tough, he's doing it to free someone. To let, there's nothing selfish about him. Even when he, he took broken bodies into his hands and he made them whole. He took broken lives, broken hearts, and he made them whole. Everything about him, the Bible says he went about doing, may the same be said about us. He went about doing good, healing, making whole, all that were oppressed of the devil. May the same be said about us in our lives. May our lives be filled with wholeness. May our relationships be whole. 
Even the verses we studied last week, if you were here, James 5, talking about prayer and effective prayer. In one place, he says, you know what? He says, pray one for another. Confess your faults. Anybody have any of those? Yeah, I do. Confess your faults one to another that you might be what? Exposed. Embarrassed. No. Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. That's the spirit. Of Jesus. May it be the spirit in your life. May it be the spirit in your ministry. In your relationships. In your home. In your businesses. God people. There's a sea of people out there. Who don't know where to go. How to get there. And whose lives have been broken. And busted up. There's a bunch of us in the room here today. Who God has taken from that place. To a higher place. I once was lost. But now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Thank God for this anointing that brings wholeness and brings healing. And God, I just, I just know he wants us praying that and wants us praying it during this time of fasting, but he wants us to go well beyond, well beyond that. Amen, church?